Despite record brevity, Liz Truss's 44 days in office will long be remembered. The UK Prime Minister resigning after a pressure that became too much. How did the Conservative Party elect a leader that so badly I misread the office. mood and the markets with her failed bid for unfunded tax cuts for the rich? We'll do forensics on a leader whose time in office could have been even shorter had the Queen not died our second day on the job. The Tories have given themselves a week to pick a replacement, the fifth since Brexit. What's the best way to choose a party leader? Would a general election be better instead? More broadly, so much has changed since the 2016 referendum to leave the EU. What kind of leadership is now needed to tackle double-digit inflation that's hurting wages and pensions, an energy crisis and war in Ukraine? How to rebound from this cascade of political crises. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Britain's leadership crisis. Uh, joining us from London, France 24, correspondent Benedict Pavio. Thanks for being with us. Of course, historic day. A journalist Peter Snowden, co-author of Cameron at Number 10, The Inside Story is with us as well. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Uh, Jeremy Stubbs is the president of the chapter of British Conservatives in uh, Paris, also a journalist with COSA. How are you? Very well, thanks, despite everything. Despite everything, okay. And despite everything, Phil Turle managed to, to, to join us as well from France 24's International Affairs Desk. Trying to make something out of the events of the past 24 hours. We're still hours, digesting it. Which is still quite difficult. And it's not over yet. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, a memo to Larry the cat. Brace yourself for yet more change at uh, number 10 Downing Street. The chief mouser to the cabinet officer, that's his title, uh, who took his quarters in 2012. He's going to go on to his fifth prime minister in six years. Since 2016 and the Brexit uh, referendum, uh, uh, this has been uh, the list. And again, there's going to be a fifth, possibly uh, by the end uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, the next week. But uh, the, the, that's not the root of the problem, the, the, the leadership, as told by the outgoing PM in her resignation speech. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low-tax, high-growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. Benny Pavio, after 44 days, do you feel when you watched that speech that you knew Liz Truss better? I think after the last six and a half weeks, we know her better, and it shows that this simply did not work, this way of selecting this. Yes, Liz Truss says that she couldn't fulfill her mandate, and she very much wants everybody to think that it was really because, almost solely because of the global uh, difficulties that, of course, other countries are experiencing, uh, the whole of the EU and, and the Western world, of course, with the war in Ukraine and the huge hike in the electricity and gas prices. And did you, uh, the did you have the, the sense, food. Benedict, that she was doubling down on that in the resignation speech? Yes. Uh, Look, it's not Theresa May coming out crying, um, but it is uh, an embattled prime minister. And this writing, as shocking as it may seem, was was on the wall um, for, uh, for, for quite a while. I think a system where you have the parliamentary party that chooses a candidate, Rishi Sunak, the former chancellor, was their number one choice. Totally understandable that they would obviously have hustings around the country. That process, I thought, was very well conducted in many ways. But the problem is that then the two final candidates, Rishi Sunak, that number one choice of the parliamentary party, and Liz Truss, the then foreign secretary, um, had, didn't have enough time, I think, to, be, to explore 
more and to have in-depth interviews, uh, really, where we drilled down on some of their plans and their vision. But it has to be said that it was Rishi Sunak who said, when listening to Liz Truss's proposals for uh, a budget, um, that it was fantasy uh, economy. And, and it's turned out to be uh, really uh, the harsh... Uh, judgment of the markets that were completely rejected uh, with all that turmoil, the battering of the pound against the dollar, against the euro, the needed intervention of the Bank of England, um, and we can come back to that, uh, where the, the pound has gone back up. But the fact of the matter is that it used to be said, Francois, that a week was a long time in British politics. Clearly, 24 hours is a long time in politics, since less than 24 hours after having said at Prime Minister's questions yesterday, uh, when embattled by many questions, amongst them a call of resignation from, unsurprisingly, the leader of the Labour Party, riding high in the polls, that Labour Party 30 points ahead of the Conservatives. Um, so Keir Starmer was calling on her to resign. And what did Liz Truss say? She said, I'm a fighter, not a quitter. Less than 24 hours later, she quits. And clearly, there is deep trauma within the Conservative Party, 12 years in power, fourth Prime Minister. And I think it is very mm. clear that the Sir Graham Brady, the head of the 1922 committee, and Jake Berry, the mm. chairman of the party, are very aware of the 10.1% inflation, uh, yeah. the real need to, to make this transition as quickly as possible. Hence, that very high threshold, only 100 they'll have to have 100 nominations, which means only basically three candidates can come through. And extraordinary to think that by Friday the 28th of October, we will have the next Conservative leader um, and next Prime Minister. It could even be sooner, Philip Turrell. Uh, the uh, Conservative Party is stating that uh, they're going to do two rounds of voting already on Monday, and if they have a winner by then, it'll all be over. It all depends how people in the Conservative Party vote. There are 357 Conservative MPs in the House of Commons. So there are only going to be a maximum of three candidates if 100 candidates have to vote for their, can their candidates. Well, 100 MPs will have to vote for their candidate because they won't be able to vote for two candidates. So it could whittle itself down to three and maybe only one if all of those MPs just back, for example, Rishi Sunak. So it'll, we'll know that he is automatically the next leader of the Conservative Party. But it looks like we could be heading towards... Uh, a runoff between two possible candidates, maybe Penny Mordaunt, uh, who is uh, the head of the House of Commons, uh, or Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor. We still don't know for the moment. There, there are a lot of candidates that are being touted as uh, possibilities, even Boris Johnson, a lot of uh, chat this afternoon about him possibly coming back to run again. He's reportedly flying back this weekend from the Caribbean where he's on holiday with his wife. So we really don't know. The bookmakers have him third or fourth, I saw. But it's just going to be impossible for Boris Johnson to run again with all the baggage that he has uh, with him and the fact that uh, he's even being investigated for lying to Parliament over the Partygate scandal and those findings haven't even been published yet. So uh, I think it's pretty impossible for, for him to con mm. consider running again. But you, you just don't know. This is such a, a, a unique period that we're learning something every five minutes about the way things are going. And here's the problem, Jeremy Stubbs, and it was outlined by Benedict at the outset. You have the parliamentary majority in Parliament that wanted something broader English public that wanted something, but the Conservative Party members who were more radical and wanted something different. So what's to say that when given a choice, they won't opt for the more hardline, radical uh, candidate? Let's not forget uh, Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, when she resigns on Wednesday, she says it's because Liz Truss uh, isn't uh, uh, hardline enough. Yes, and that's on the matter of, of, of immigration specifically. But the, the, the fact is that the parliamentary party are more attuned to the mood of the country than the party members are because they rely on the electorate for their position. So does the system have to be changed? Well, let's say that the system as it stands is a wonderful system for a party that's in opposition but for a party that's actually in government and may need to change its leader practically overnight, it's not a good system. I think that throughout the summer, there was inaction while all these hustings were taking place. Uh, the contestants were in something of a bubble. I think Liz Truss was in a bubble. She thought it was all about ideology, where in fact it's about urgent practical steps to but save the country. But clearly it was, because she won. She was elected prime minister. Yeah, 
But that's because, precisely, she only had to please party members. She was not being elected in front of the country or by her own colleagues who understood a little bit better the actual and urgent and desperate situation of the country. So you're calling for the system to be changed. Are many inside your party also calling for that? I don't think anyone is actually calling for anything yet, but they are expressing doubts and I'm sure everything is going to be up in the air after all of this, that's for sure. Peter Snowden, uh, your, your thoughts uh, with the, the, the discussion we're having here uh, about uh, what the legacy of Liz Truss's uh, time in office will be after 44 days. Well, it's unprecedented, isn't it? It's the shortest tenure of any British prime minister going back to 1721 when Sir Robert Walpole was the first recognised holder of that office. And George Canning currently holds the record of 119 days, and he sadly died in office in the 1820s. So I don't think she will even reach half of his uh, record, his tenure in office. I mean, it's extraordinary. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. Uh, three, potentially three prime ministers, if it's not Boris Johnson, uh, in one year. And as you say, the fourth or uh, fifth prime minister in the space of six years. It's quite incredible. Uh, obviously, the Conservative Party uh, is undergoing a, a period of considerable difficulty, trauma, you might say, and that was evidenced last night when you saw uh, the scenes, the rancour in the House of Commons in the division lobby. So it's, it's, it's quite incredible as a political historian to watch what is unfolding in front of our eyes, a party that is struggling to hold on to office with a majority of over 70, a working majority of over 70. I mean, we last saw this sort of incredible scene of political instability in the 1970s under Jim Callaghan when he lost his majority, and then under John Major, the Conservative Prime Minister in the mid-90s when he lost his majority and he saw rebellions. But something like this with a, uh, a, a governing party with a very significant majority uh, is, is really incredible, actually. And what's it? What's it about, to Peter? 1905. What's it about? Is it about incumbent fatigue? Uh, the Conservatives have been in power now uh, since 2010, I believe. Uh, is it is it uh, about Brexit? Uh, what's this all about? Well, I think it's both those uh, factors, really. I mean, obviously, Brexit has destabilised the entire political system in this country and the reverberations will be felt whichever side of the argument you are on it has destabilized all the political parties but the conservative party happens to be in office and so everything is brought into sharp relief but also as you've discussed as the uh, other contributors have said the contest after boris johnson's uh, departure was really uh, quite difficult ideologically you saw differences very sharp differences over economic policy between Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. And uh, obviously the party membership had one view and the parliamentary party held another. And that is very difficult to reconcile. Very, very difficult. And of course the leader of the party in Parliament has to have the confidence of their MPs. And without that, whatever uh, political party they're in, it's very difficult to survive in, in the building behind me. Yeah, the swings, uh, we, we've seen them, uh, I guess you could say, just in the matter of days, sometimes in the matter of hours during the past week. The writing was on the wall uh, Wednesday with the resignation of Truss as Home Secretary. As we were mentioning, Suella Braverman, uh, a hardline Brexiter, her letter uh, made it clear uh, that uh, uh, she uh, was uh, stepping down uh, because she disagreed with Truss. Uh, really, though, since last Friday, when Jeremy Hunt took charge of the chancellery and reversed the tax cuts of his predecessor's mini-budget, mini Liz Truss was fast losing uh, her grip already. One uh, uh, political reporter uh, who had stated uh, that uh, the, this is uh, uh, the uh, Philip Turrell, um, a tax cut that the rich hadn't asked for. And uh, here you have uh, the, the, this, and you just heard Peter Snowden describe it, uh, the two wings of the party uh, who are playing out their battle almost in real time. 
Well, on the one side, you had Liz Truss with her neoliberal uh, free market policies. Um, basically, the markets will control everything. The markets are going to make sure that everything's OK. Uh, this is, for a great part, policies put forward by a group of, of lobbies, lobbies which uh, regularly meet uh, in a street not far from Downing Street, of which Liz Truss is one of the members and has been there dozens of times, like her former Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng. Uh, and they put forward a whole lot of plans of tax cuts for the rich and uh, clamping down on uh, public services in the UK. And when Liz Truss was elected leader of the Conservative Party, they, for great part, got into Downing Street. So that was the backbone of her economic policy that was then announced in this emergency budget on the 23rd of September, which sent the markets reeling, the pound plunging, and led to the Bank of England having to intervene in a catastrophe to, to, to save the pound and to also save pensions in the UK, and led to the sacking of Kwasi Kwarteng. Then we had the nomination of Jeremy Hunt, who came along and trashed all of Liz Truss's economic policies. Uh, and it was quite well laid out as the fact that Kwasi Kwarteng and, and Liz Truss were in a car driving one way with Kwasi Kwarteng behind the wheel. Then he was kicked out of the car and Jeremy Hunt got in. He turned the car around and drove the other way. And people said, well, what's Liz Truss still doing in the car? Because she was the one who bought these policies in in the first place. And now Jeremy Hunt is doing away with them. And that shifted the leadership not onto Liz Truss, but onto Jeremy Hunt, saying it was obviously him who's calling the shots to try mm. to calm the markets down and calm down public worry about the fact they're going to see their mortgage rates shooting up in the future, they're going to see an increase in inflation, uh, and many people are worried about how they're going to make ends meet at the end of the month. The only thing that Liz Truss came up with was this £2,500 limit on energy bills that people will pay per household. But even that was trashed in a way by Jeremy Hunt because it was originally going to be for two years. And he said, well, unfortunately, it's only going to be until next April, which means, well, how are people going to cope after April with paying their fuel bills? So all of these elements, one after the other, and the trashing of Liz Truss's policies led to the fact she was in a totally untenable position. The leader of the opposition renewing his call this Thursday for a general election and blasting the Tories over their infighting. We can't have a revolving door of chaos. We can't have another experiment at the top of the Tory party. There is an alternative, and that's a stable Labour government. And the public are entitled to have their say, and that's why there should be a general election. With uh, Jer Jeremy Stubbs, with the um, uh, uh, expedited... A naming of a new leader, this crisis of legitimacy in the high halls of power. Wouldn't a snap general election be better for all around? Well, I think that that is a question everybody has, has to ask themselves. But at the moment, there just isn't time in this desperate situation to go through the whole rigmarole of an election. We've already been through a protracted, overly protracted leadership election in the Conservative Party, another election... Somebody has got to come in who can stabilise the situation, I would say, at least until Christmas, and then there will be, I think, very real pressure for some change, for some new election. At the moment, the Conservatives still have in their gift, as it were, the power to call an election, and where, where they are in the polls right now, they're never going to call one, uh, not until there's some improvement there. So Keir Starmer, he's doing his job, he's calling for an election. I don't think he's going to get one. But at the moment, the main questions are, can we survive over the next few weeks, the next couple of months? That's where we are, I'd say. Uh, you agree with that, Peter Snowden? Yes, I think in the short term, it is a question of political survival for the government. Uh, I mean, huge instability, uh, a political and economic crisis. Uh, obviously created by the mini-budget and the U-turns that we've seen and the dramatic resignations in government, but also the issue with the war in Ukraine, which is a, a very uh, serious uh, situation. So, yes, it's, it's going to be very difficult uh, to resolve. The, the stability of the government will be the first priority of the new leader and the new prime minister and they will have to create an 
even keel, at least within the parliamentary party, and regain confidence within the parliamentary party. That will be the first priority of the, uh, the new prime minister. Truss's, res Truss's resignation falling just as leaders of the EU27 happened to be gathering for a summit in Brussels. I want to say that France, as a friend of the British people, hopes above all for stability in the current context, which is one of war, of tensions over energy and a wider crisis. It is very important that the United Kingdom soon regains political stability. That's all I hope for. Uh, th that call for uh, stability uh, coming, as we've heard as well, uh, from another precinct, the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Maria Zakharova, calling Liz Truss a disgrace of a leader who'd be remembered for her catastrophic illiteracy. And uh, while Truss's grip on power was imploding, her defense secretary had to keep a lookout on the Black Sea, where Ben Wallace says Russia fired a missile from international waters past an unarmed British fighter jet on routine patrol. In Parliament, they're conscious that the rest of the world is agape at events unfolding in London. The rest of the world takes a huge interest in what Britain does. They like to see leadership from us, not least in what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, which could get very bumpy indeed with uh, Putin's back against the wall. And they are just wondering what on earth is happening in this country as things unravel. We need to sort this out, not just for our own benefit, but indeed for our role on the international stage. Yeah, Benedict Pavio, this is a reminder that uh, uh, there is a lot going on and a lot at stake, uh, including Vladimir Putin's nuclear threats. Absolutely. And indeed, that same Secretary of Defense, Ben Wallace, rushed to Washington the other day, cancelled a very important uh, meeting he had with a parliamentary committee, the Defense Committee. We don't know uh, the exact reason for that trip to Washington or indeed what was discussed. Uh, perhaps it was to do... We think it was very much to do with that nuclear threat and to do with Ukraine. These are serious times. They require serious leaders, Ben Wallace, who interestingly didn't want to uh, step into the leadership battle in the summer and whose name is again prominently featuring. He's a very um, safe pair of hands. That's the way he's perceived um, and seen as somebody who might be able uh, to be that unifying uh, party candidate. I just wanted to point out two very quick mistakes, I think, that um, Liz Truss made. In a British uh, interview some weeks ago, she pointed out uh, and seemed rather proud of the fact that she was a controversialist, as she said, she was a disruptor. Clearly, what the country needs is not a disruptor. It actually needs, because there are so many serious problems, 10.1 inflation, postal strikes, uh, train, national rail and tube strikes, uh, a looming nurses strike, uh, all wanting their wages to be linked and uh, raised by uh, index to inflation and not wages earning. Um, so clearly that was a misreading of the mood and clearly the markets and many people, um, economists and others besides and some of her colleagues, did not like and rejected that mini-budget, mini-budget which was completely trashed, deleted, shredded on Monday by the new Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, and who we, if he's still the... Uh, Chancellor, um, we expect to hear from on the 31st of October. Hence why also there needs to be a Prime Minister in place very quickly. But the other thing that may be very relevant, and I would suggest it is to whoever is the next occupant of number 10, is the fact that Liz Truss uh, rejected anybody who didn't back her. She basically didn't have anybody who was her political rival, or very few. Yes, she had Penny Mordaunt as leader of the House of Commons, but basically nobody who supported Rishi Sunak. Um, and what is interesting about Jeremy Hunt and what is also interesting, uh, so that second finance minister, and also about the second Home Secretary, Grant Shapps, former transport minister, is the fact that they both supported who? They supported Rishi Sunak. So she was finally, in her desperate hours in battle, trying to open up the door of number 10 to finally somebody, two people who are highly respected, who were Rishi Sunak supporters. The problem for Rishi Sunak is there is a saying in British politics, he who wields the dagger never inherits the crown. In other words, when you stab 
metaphorically speaking, a leader, let alone the Prime Minister, you don't get to become Prime Minister and leader. That will be held against you. And that is one of the problems, the main problems, for Rishi Sunak, uh, who is perceived as not only having been um, too forceful in some of the debates with Liz Truss, and that went down pretty badly uh, with the membership, but also that he has that wielding dagger image within the party. And that is why there are question marks about whether he could be uh, that unifying candidate and the next prime minister. Sounds, I don't know whether it sounds more like Macbeth or House of Cards, Jeremy Stubbs, but either way, uh, we could have a, a lot more drama just in the coming days. Well, of course, what we need is less drama in the coming days. We need safe pairs of hands all over the place. And I think people have understood that. Because the, uh, the Conservative Party is, uh, like the Labour Party, a big tent, supposed to be. And how was it that the, that the Tories elected a leader who thought she could govern without the other wings of the party. I think, as I say, it's, it's that bubble of the election process where she engaged in hustings before Conservative Party members. Now, obviously, I'm a member, and I'm not going to denounce Conservative Party members, but it's not the same as being in front of the wider electorate. And they're the people you've got to please. Of course... Rishi Sunak has the intellectual capacities to do this job, but as he's already been rejected by Conservative Party members over the summer, if he is put into place by the MPs, Conservative Party members will see that as a betrayal of their trust. So we're in a difficult situation, and uh, it's, it's probably going to have to be somebody quite different. Uh, Peter Snowden, you, you and I were together in, in London speaking after the death of the Queen, at the time, when you were in London, you didn't feel as though uh, the, the political doom that uh, the political, the economic doom that uh, Philip Turrell was describing uh, was there. London was London's bustling. It's doing well. There's the cafes are full. There's lots of uh, of tourists and, and foreigners. It's a very different picture from the rest of the UK. Is this a problem of the Conservative Party or is that bubble just basically all politicians who are in Westminster and perhaps not? not in touch with what's happening elsewhere in the country. Well, I think just since that momentous event in British history, the death of the, the late Queen, uh, you've seen huge changes. I mean, uh, rising cost of living, I know that was carrying on before uh, her death, and you've inflation and the war in Ukraine. But I think the general sense of political crisis combined with an economic crisis, combined with uh, the first war on the continent of Europe since the Second World War, has really added to a sense of uh, foreboding uh, in British public life, and, and that's obviously felt by the public more widely. When you see opinion polls and you hear what they're saying, there's a general sense of uh, fear and foreboding. Right, and, when, said, and on that, I think you, and on that point, the when Jeremy in London, it's, it, it's doing well. well. On that point, Jeremy Stubbs, when he says that uh, uh, that the, the British are a bit shell shocked right now, and an election is not what they want at this very moment. Do you agree? Peter? Um, yeah, well, I, sorry, I didn't know that was directed to me, sorry. Um, I, I think uh, an election is certainly a distinct possibility. Um, as you've said, it's within the gift of the government to uh, call an election. And I think whoever comes into office, they will be reading the opinion polls uh, the same as everyone else, as you and I. And I think it will be an act of political suicide. I think they would have to have a complete collapse or there would have to be an issue or a vote of confidence in, in the House of Commons in which the government uh, is so divided that the Conservative Party rebels against itself and it loses uh, a, a confidence vote. That would be have to be an issue. But I'm sure any new incumbent would have to be treading very carefully. And I'm sure the 350 or so Conservative MPs will be thinking uh, about this very pressing question at the moment, about who can provide some sort of stability and unity in the very short term. So I think the prospect of a general election, though a possibility, I think is a remote one. And they
it doesn't have to be one, obviously, actually until January 2025, although I don't think uh, the Parliament will probably run that long. But I expect most people will think a new Prime Minister will want to have a period of months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, to get their feet under the desk, if they survive that long, of course. All right, the next Prime Minister, by the way, can pick his or her druthers 24 hours after Britain learned of higher than expected 10.1% inflation. That's the highest in four decades. Uh, it's a case of uh, uh, whether to raise pensions and benefits accordingly or try to stop a further spiral uh, of the public uh, deficit. Uh, not an easy choice to make, Benedict Pavio. Not an easy choice to make. And indeed, how interesting that uh, Liz Truss, only yesterday in the House of Commons, to everybody's surprise, because it was the big question, said that the triple lock, that pensions would uh, be indexed with uh, the inflation. And it shows what had happened is that no longer were her commitments trusted anymore. But let me turn to somebody who is an insider of Westminster politics, who's called Alva Ray, who joins me. Thank you, Alva. And you are the host of a podcast for Politico. It's called The Westminster Insider. The mood of the country, we've got um, a second chancellor, We've got a second prime minister. We've got now this leadership election. Um, the Labour Party is clamouring, demanding, as are the Liberal Democrats, are the Scottish National Party, for a general election. How much do you think anybody, any Tory leader and prime minister, can come here and really satisfy this real clamour across the country for a general election? Well, I mean, you can hear how fractious it is. The protesters just at the bottom of Downing Street. That's the way it always is in Parliament on busy days like this, because really things have been very divided in the country for quite a long time. We've got Remainers out there, also Boris supporters out there, anti-vaxxers out there. I think the mood in the country is just really febrile. I'm not really sure if people want a general election so soon after the last one. Are we going to have a general election every two years and then another unstable government? But I think also there's a real fear in the Conservative Party about what it will look like to have another uh, unelected um, leader in place, which is a, a case for Boris Johnson that we're hearing from his supporters, that he's the only person who's actually got a mandate from the country. He was already ousted, but as far as they say, that's the only thing that insulates them from that big attack from Labour. It's interesting. You used a, word, used a word there that I have to pick up on, and that is Remainer. And Peter Snowden was referring earlier on, and I think he possibly is the only one, if my ears don't deceive me, and he used the word Brexit. And, of course, that is the elephant in the room. I read uh, only yesterday where Jeremy Hunt, Liz Truss, um, and I think it was Grant Shapps, were being described as Remainers. Now, many people said that after the... You know, we should get rid of those titles, but this is still swirling around. So is Brexit still very much rather than as David Cameron a previous incumbent some years ago of this illustrious 10 Downing Street, is that is Brexit still and this whole Remainer lever uh, warfare really continuing to really pose a fundamental problem for the Conservatives? I think so. I think basically they just don't know what they stand for anymore. And it, in a way, with Boris Johnson, they reinvented themselves. So many of their manifesto pledges in 2019 were a complete reversal of what we were seeing from the Conservative He appealed to, to, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, he appealed to people um, and uh, that whole red wall yeah. that uh, that's what was so extraordinary about Boris Johnson, wasn't it? Yeah, that it's completely different people, working class people in northern industrial towns, like who, you know, historic Labour voters, but also, I suppose, um, a, you know, different, a different voter coalition. And, and then I suppose with Boris Johnson now, um, the problem is that the Tory party, you've got people who see themselves as traditional conservatives like David Cameron, George Osborne, you have people who had a sort of libertarian interpretation of Brexit, like Liz Truss. You have then, then people, again, like Boris Johnson, who want to be promising new things, like, you know, more investment and more sort of, you know, progressive. Um, and uh, those three visions really can't all coexist. And I don't think the, the Conservative Party can find what it, what it stands for very easily. It's not so, just about the people. So the million-pound question, I think a fair one, but here's the tough one. Who do you think is most likely to be among the two or three names of potential candidates? And ultimately, who do you think is going to walk through that door either Monday, if it's some sort of coronation, or by next Friday? 
Uh, I mean, I think Rishi Sunak is in with a very good shot, but I would also mention Penny Mordaunt because I think there's a, a fear among some Conservative MPs that Rishi Sunak has already been rejected by Conservative members because he lost in that election against Liz Truss and maybe Penny Mordaunt would be the less divisive figure because just as much as Boris Johnson is disliked by parts of the party, so is Rishi Sunak. Maybe Penny Mordaunt will be able to get the numbers behind her. So we could have a, another female prime minister. But who knows? We will see. Handing back to you in Paris. All right. So, so we're playing that game, Benedict. OK, well, let's 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 go around the room here a little bit. We, <laughs> we heard uh, Benedict uh, talk about daggers and uh, and why that makes perhaps Richie Sunak's bid uh, to become prime minister uh, an uphill battle. Jeremy Stubbs, who's the next prime minister? Well, somebody who's already replaced the prime minister uh, in, in, in the House of Commons. That's On Penny Monday, we saw that. Yep, she was considered quite competent. T describe, for us, describe for our viewers, Philip, who is Penny Morton? So she is uh, the leader of the House of Commons. She is uh, actually quite a slick mover in, in uh, British politics. And she got the chance, really... Uh, and I don't know if this is on purpose or not, the other day when uh, Liz Truss was due to come to uh, the House of Commons uh, prior to the announcement by Jeremy Hunt of his economic programme be, be in front of MPs. And to everyone's surprise, Liz Truss didn't turn up. And Liz Truss had told Penny Morden to take her place. And we saw for the first time Penny Morden in the stature of a prime minister and gave a pretty good show in front of everybody, much better than, than, than Liz Truss has been giving. And I think impressed quite a lot of people that, yeah, maybe this is the lady who could take over from Liz Truss. This is what we need. This is the person we should have elected the other the, the, the time before. Uh, and it, uh, during that uh, question and answer session, which was a bit like prime minister's question time, People said, well, why isn't Liz Truss here? Why isn't Liz Truss standing here answering the questions? And Penny Morden kept saying, she is busy, she can't come. And they were saying, well, what is it that she's doing that makes it so important she can't come and answer questions? And then she said, well, I can't tell you because I've been told not to say anything. And then all of a sudden, Liz Truss turns up and sits down. Because so people question, thought she may have gone to Ukraine. Well, I think they, they didn't think that, but I think they thought that she uh, was maybe talking to the 1922 committee chairman, Sir Graham Brady. And so the question was asked again, uh, well, what was Liz Truss doing? And uh, the uh, Speaker of the House of Commons said, no, 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 we're not going to answer that question now. It's time to listen to Jeremy Hunt. So we didn't know, but it came out afterwards that she had been talking to Sir Graham Brady and probably being told that her time at number 10 was going to be pretty limited. So she'd given this card to Penny Mordaunt, who shone in her place. And I think that has certainly boosted her chances of maybe pulling off a, a win in this election contest. This, this race, Peter Snowden, uh, it's a little confusing for some on this side of the channel because uh, after the events of the past week, uh, the French financial press seems to think that you already have a new prime minister. That's uh, the finance minister, Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what happens? Because they, they, they've made it clear he's going to stick around until uh, the, this, uh, the, this update on the budget that's coming on October the 31st. So who's in charge? Uh, well, for the time being, uh, the building, the front door behind me, number 11 uh, Downing Street, is probably where the power is in reality and has been since he was appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, in a dramatic fashion last week when Kwasi Kwarteng uh, left the government. So essentially, I mean, he uh, has a lot of the power. We have Liz Truss, who remains Prime Minister, caretaker Prime Minister for another... Uh, week uh, until next Friday. But yes, I mean, he certainly uh, is in a very powerful position. He's declared he's not going to stand, which is a significant moment we shouldn't go unnoticed today. But I think the chances of him remaining as Chancellor are probably quite significant, uh, because obviously he uh, has established his credentials. He's a very experienced Cabinet Minister, uh, along with Liz Truss. He's one of the survivors uh, of Cabinet, going all the way back to 2010. But then won't he overshadow Cameron, uh, became prime minister won't he overshadow whoever becomes the new pm 
Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the, the relationship with whoever it is, uh, Rishi Sunak, Penny Mordaunt, you've just been discussing, uh, Boris Johnson, I can see that being a, a more tr uh, difficult relationship, uh, probably. But um, interestingly, I think Rishi Sunak, Jeremy Hunt, Penny Mordaunt, they're not that dissimilar within uh, Tory party politics. Their politics aren't that different. Uh, obviously, Jeremy Hunt was a Remainer. Uh, Rishi Sunak was a Lever, as was Penny Mordaunt. Um, so it'll be interesting to see that combination. And of course, Liz Truss, we shouldn't forget, uh, although she changed her views, was a Remainer. And it was seen that it would be very difficult uh, for a Remainer to become Prime Minister, certainly after the experience of Theresa May. So I think it's going to be a very interesting uh, development to see how Jeremy Hunt, if he remains as Chancellor and the new Prime Minister, how that relationship is forged. Uh, there's an overarching problem, and we're running short on time. We could talk about this for hours, uh, Jeremy Stubb. And that is, you and I have talked about this oftentimes on this set, the, the, the vitriol, which didn't used to characterize uh, British politics as much. Now, with the pressures that Philip was describing, uh, winter without uh, Russian gas, uh, double-digit inflation, uh, w what can be done to improve that mood? Well, I think that... Uh the main thing that will focus people's minds is the urgency of the situation. And the fact that somebody like Jeremy Hunt is there is already a sign that people want some kind of moderation. And the scenes we saw last night in the House of Commons were exactly what brought the end of Liz Truss. The scenes of quarrelling, of violence, uh, potentially. There was one uh, Labour MP accusing uh, some in the Conservative Party of bullying members to change their vote on a... On That's right. There, there was talk of, of, of members being manhandled by whips, of whips resigning, of being reinstated. We don't know... I don't think we know exactly what happened. But the, the, this whole sort of out-of-control, as you say, vitriolic atmosphere... People can only stand that for so long. I think that, you know, in a sense, the abscess, excuse the uh, metaphor, is going to be burst by all this. People will want stability. They will want calm. And they know it's urgent. So perhaps that's the salvation if there is one. I think they want stability and they want calm. The big question is, do they want it with the Conservative Party? And that is the question for the moment that is very much up in the air. And it looks pretty much like if there were a, an opinion poll in the UK, do you want a general election right now? The overwhelming majority of people would say yes. Would say yes. OK, D difference of opinion. I in one word, uh, uh, Benedict Pavio, do you think we'll have a PM in eight days or as early as next Monday? Oh, that's a very, very tough one. I think probably by next Friday. Probably by next Friday. This story is going to run. I want to thank you, uh, uh, Benedicta, for being with us outside number 10. Uh, Peter Snowden for being outside number 11, Downing Street, uh, the home of the Chancellor uh, of the Exchequer. I want to thank uh, as well Jeremy Stubbs, Philip Terrell. Thank you. Our coverage of uh, the situation unfolding in the UK on our website, France24.com. Stay with us.